uh, colorectal cancer. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, uh, a chance to talk slightly earlier. Although it is titled as chemo radiation therapy, I uh, will allow myself to speak on a slightly wider topic. I'm going to talk about combined treatment because today we have one treatment modalities. Um, then further on, we might result in other treatment modalities. And again, the selection of patients is quite problematic. We shall t talk about combined treatment. What do we expect from it? First and foremost, in the recent two decades, the strategies uh, have been changed a lot. And at the moment, it is a very dynamic process of changing and introducing new treatment modalities. Why? First of all, we'll reassess the role of prognostic factors, not only the treatment outcomes, but also in the selection of treatment modality. Second, I will explain it. If previously we talked about proximal and distal resection margins, then as our pathologists has, have just demonstrated, the more, most uh, attention is paid towards the circular resection margins, and uh, this is something that we reassessed. Second, the introduction of contemporary methods which allow us more precisely to more precisely uh, grade the tumor process and tumor dissemination. These are um, MRI and uh, ERAS, which uh, I to, uh, and I talked about it. Uh, I talked in my first presentation about uh, Rurik Melnikov, and uh, uh, they were full of intuition and knowledge, but they had no technology in their hands. We do. Then also the improvement of the principles of acute um, resection, uh, and uh, I mean TME. Uh, again, first of all, it was all. Um, it's the sharp resection. Uh, of course, in the, uh, having all the tools that we have in our hands today, it, uh, it simplifies the process. But we have this, you know, uh, the total mesorectomy is something that's very important nonetheless. And also the wide application of no adjuvant chemo radiation therapy, which again uh, increases the organ sparing surgeries, and it might lead to the uh, improvement of long-term outcomes. When we come about prognostic factors, then, uh, generally speaking, we have certain prognostic factors, and uh, these are the prognostic factors that influence the course of disease, uh, disregarding the um, treatment. And the predictive factors are exactly the uh, factors that uh, help us to correctly plan treatment for colorectal patients. So this is a slide that is very important as well, and that has been demonstrated several times. What is most important nowadays in order to choose the treatment modality? First of all, we should base on the prognostic factors. Most important prognostic factors of the local relapse is the shortest distance between the tumor and the uh, colon fascia. But the problem is that the T classification and even the seventh version do not differentiate the uh, remote and adjacent tumors, they are all classified as T3. Nonetheless, they have a different risk of local relapse development, and they require a different approach to treatment. This is a very important aspect. Then, uh, this is a study by Merkel uh, 2003, long-term outcomes with, uh, in patients with the same stage T3, but we have different outcomes, T3A, T3A, this is a long distance between the tumor and the fascia, but if there is, uh, if the tumor is adjacent and even there is ingrowth, then you can see a completely different five-year survival. It's 54.1 uh, only. This is uh, an, uh, another study, study Mercury by uh, Taylor et al., which was uh, conducted in 2010. You can see again similar results. If the circular resection mar margin was free, then the uh, frequency of uh, prevalence of relapse is, uh, is about 7%. But if there is ingrowth, then it grows up to 21.9. So MRI uh, and the assessment of this distance, in fact, uh, is an independent prognostic factor. So MRI is a golden standard in, uh, in order to assess the uh, local relapse uh, and the, well, 
have the forecast. You can see here the in the um, uh, circular resection margin on MRI. Uh, this is a very highly sensitive and specific uh, method, which uh, makes it a golden standard both abroad and in our country. The presence of MRI is a must today in order to select the treatment modality because otherwise we are blinded. As of today, what is the standard method of treatment? First of all, surgical treatment, both for two, uh, T2 and T3. Of course, it is a sharp resection of colon and mesorectum, a total mesorectomy. But what is the main uh, t uh, goal of this uh, treatment? First of all, to uh, achieve the peripheral margins free of the tumor cells, because this will be associated with the either high or low resection, um, uh, relapse rate. And this is very, uh, this is utterly important. And also, we should understand that the tumor can be removed within healthy tissue only by surgical method if it uh, in growth is restricted with the um, intestine cell. If it grows outside, then the chances uh, are very low. So, uh, defining or uh, seeing the connection of the tumor with a proper fascia of the rectum uh, is a very important factor. Uh, and MRI actually enables us to uh, test and to check this factor. So, you can see how well with MRI we can see the uh, rectal fascia. And uh, in this case, we could see clearly there is no risk for involvement of the resection margin. It's uh, quite uh, far away, so it's a T3 tumor with a good prognosis. And you can see it quite nicely with uh, MRI, where the distance is more than five millimeters. But there is a completely different situation. We can see a clear threat of involvement of the resection margin, or maybe it's already involved, but it's a T3 tumor, but with a poor prognosis. And we can see another MRI. The distance between the MRI and uh, uh, fascia uh, propria is less than two millimeters. So it makes possible to say that start to start the treatment with the surgery actually could result in relapses in much poorer prognosis in those patients. So based on those uh, data, that's uh, how the treatment, uh, what is the treatment approach for patients? Uh, the tumor is like, uh, the tumor is, uh, mm, so we can see in case of uh, uh, rectal cancer is a good prognosis, T1, T2, poor prognosis, T3A above one millimeter, and poor prognosis, T3B is then one millimeter. And uh, this classification, good, bad, and ugly, uh, this classification is the most convenient. What we mean by the poor prognosis, T3A tumor, it goes through all the layers of uh, mesorectal fascia. Uh, uh, it is a fat, but the distance of, uh, to fascia proper is more than one millimeter. And in these cases, we think not us, but we consider that we should do pre-op radiation in concentrated mode five by five gray uh, plus t uh, TMA. And uh, the uh, terrible prognosis in, in three bay tumors, it goes through all layers and goes into the pararectal fat. And the distance to fascia proper is less than one millimeter. And uh, here's we uh, pre-op surgery, uh, uh, of course, is indicated here, followed with TMA. So what are the advantages we would like to assess with you? For uh, what are the advantages of any methods? What will be the indication to assess those advantages? First of all, we're talking about the uh, uh, rate of local relapses, possibility to expand the surgery to do sphincter saving uh, to expand the indications to sphincter salving interventions, uh, sphincter functions, survival rate, toxicity, and quality of life. And uh, these are, uh, we should understand that radiation and chemotherapy uh, are not methods without complications, and it might result in short and long term complications, and we have to take these issues into account for sure. These are the basic protocol. It's a Dutch study. I think it's not a new one. Many of you have heard about it, but in the 80s and the 90s, Bill Hill, actually, who developed the management of uh, TMA uh, patients, he suggested to stop using radiation therapy and he thought oh, that only with the surgery we can gain great results. Everybody knows about that. The relapse rate was really high those days, but it raised some doubts. And they conducted such a large Dutch study, which showed 
So two arms shown here. One in one arm, uh, patients uh, were treated all the way to me, only surgery. And the other arm, uh, it was a pre-op uh, radiation therapy concentrate mode five by five, followed with a surgery, uh, uh, following surgery with total removal of mesorectum. And we can clearly see that even if, uh, even with uh, TME, the relapse rate. Uh, was uh, was more uh, was eleven uh, percent, and it drops almost twofold uh, after pre-op uh, radiation. So five-year survival with such treatment is uh, remains the same. What are the issues were raised after that? First of all, if it's possible to improve local control, and if it's possible to improve survival rate, if it's not improve, increased after such a style. Another important question, can we uh, can we uh, do more sphincter-saving surgeries to, uh, to elongate in the period between the radiation and surgery, increase the radiation dose, or use of parallel or simultaneous chemotherapy? So it's important to say that uh, um, RCT data showed that use of concentrated radiation therapy, which was a method of choice, was a followed immediate surgery, does result in considerable clinical and uh, postmorphological tumor regress, and thus we cannot, uh, thus we cannot increase the rate uh, of sphincter-saving surgeries. This is above beyond the capacity of this method. Uh, so the concentrated radiation therapy, this treatment, first of all, is uh, aimed for more ablastic intervention. But we cannot think about uh, uh, regression of the tumor or less volume of intervention. There is no time for that because surgery is done within 24, 72 hours post radiation, or and uh, not more than one week. So there is no regress, uh, no regression of tumor, and we don't know if it will come ever. Uh, we can assume that uh, elongation of this interval, pre-op interval, might improve those. Uh, uh, those indices, and there was a, there was a study with Lyon protocol, to more than 200 patients, T2, T3 tumors located in the low ampulla rectum. We can see that in first group, uh, in the immediate intervention, we reached a, a regression 53 percent clinically, and 72 with elongated pre-op interval, 72 percent. Pathological, pathological regression, we had 10 percent after immediate intervention, in 26 percent after pre elongated pre-op period. So, uh, so pre-op so pre-op radiation and elongated pre-op interval uh, improved. Uh, uh, provided us a new horizons in treatment of such a patient. That was a big, considerable revolution. I uh, know uh, what we what we do understand uh, when we say complete regression, complete uh, clinical regression, perf complete pathomorphological regression. Does is it of any value for us? What do we, how would we define it? We would like. I would like to talk to you with uh, the same language. What does it mean complete clinical regression? When the tumor cannot be uh, cannot be determined uh, based on the physical and instrumental examination. What is a what's a morphological complete morphological regression? And we can assess it uh, only when we study the uh, surgical specimen. So when we talk about the complete regression, post chemo and radiation therapy, we try to somehow call it as a complete pathomorphological regression and with other words, but still. Several years ago, we came to a clear, uh, to clear understanding, which is, uh, which is clear for us these days. After chemo radiation, we can, uh, with uh, using modern examination methods, we can talk only about the complete uh, clinical regression. We don't know if it is complete pathological or not. Uh, the correlation issues of clinical and pathological regression is the issue for further studies. These are the studies uh, provided by Professor Gabar Gama. Maybe we'll see after some time if a patient reached complete clinical regression, he had, he had, there was no surgery and still, still lived without uh, signs of metastasis and relapses, then uh, probably we can say that there was complete pathological regression. But in all other cases, only morphologists, only pathomorphologists could answer this question. For sure, that, that's very important to understand here. Complete clinical regression. It could be so-called immediate, meaning we did uh, chemo or radiation. We saw complete regression, non-clinical, not with uh, digital examination, not uh, there no MRI shows tumor. That's an immediate complete regression. But talking about the permanent or stable clinical regression, that's uh, we can we can say uh, we can talk about it if a complete clinical regression uh, remained for one year if 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 after one year patient doesn't develop any new signs of uh, 
renewed, renewed growth, resumed growth, not relapse, because uh, there might be some residual tumor. We never, we might not know about that. So if there is for 12 months, there is no growth, no renewal of the tumor growth, then it is a complete clinical regression. If it, if it appears there was no complete clinical regression, it means that we should improve our diagnostic method and assessment of this regression, and we should look where we made error, where we made a mistake. Complete clinical regression. As to the studies data, how, how often we see it for T1, T2 tumors, 25-35% of cases. For T3, T4 tumors, a bit less, 20-25% of cases. Oh. Uh, what pre-op uh, chemo radiation uh, provides us? Uh, we irradiate zone of regional metastasis and increases with time. It's a very important issue. I really like when you mentioned the previous, to uh, previous speech, when you mentioned assessment effects of chemo radiation uh, on the basis of MRI. It increases with time. In two, four weeks, uh, in four weeks, we see it only 25% of cases. But but it, after 12 weeks, we see in more than 30% of cases. We see clinical, complete clinical regression. It's very important. But so we shouldn't haste to do MRI in the short term post uh, chemo and radiation, because first of all, you won't see the true result. Uh, but also, you would see overstaging. Uh, that's very important. So you shouldn't hurry up. Shouldn't haste. So that's uh, on endoscopy, we see, we see complete clinical regression. 10 weeks post uh, chemo radiation, we see some residual signs. In 12 weeks, the mucosa is quite, uh, is white and clean. Uh, four weeks post chemo radiation, we see the ulceration quite clear. We see in endoscopy in 12 weeks, nothing. We see nothing here. And here, we're talking about the incomplete clinical regression. We see residual ulcer. Uh, we saw it before uh, chemo radiation, and we see it eight weeks after chemo radiation. Uh, what uh, Haberama uh, tells us, who is the uh, founder of this method, which actually uh, conquers the world, it's quite interesting for all of us to cite this method. Use of additional chemotherapy after completion of chemo radiation therapy, no, for not that we not that weeks that we wait six, eight, or twelve weeks, not just a waiting period. We by that time we provide chemotherapy, and in this case, as to the Hamburgama data, we can increase uh, rate of complete clinical regression up to 65 percent. Think about that. Think about that. Uh, more than every second patient. That's a very important addition, very important result, and that's in our data. This is our data where we studied uh, MRI capacities in our clinics. So you see the uh, positive prognostic value of, uh, when assessing effects of neoadjuvant chemo and radiation. So in, in reality, we can say only about the complete uh, clinical regression. We can assess it uh, correctly in 66% of cases if you if you look uh, TNM. So T1, uh, 30%, T2, 52%, T3, 53%, T4, 40%. We can see negative uh, lymph nodes. In 88% of cases, we we, uh, we gain uh, the uh, uh, right answer. And it correlates with international data saying that when we talk about the so-called downstaging, meaning decrease in the stage of the disease uh, at the TNM classification, it's not adequate and it's less uh, important for the prognosis than the assessments of the uh, therapy on the basis of regression, based on the tumor regression. And this, uh, uh, and that's, of course, where we, sh we should look at the regression uh, level because it makes possible for us to assess it properly and makes possible for us to plan the surgery and look uh, and have a better prognostic value. I don't want to assess the assessment of regression stage using the receipt scale. So it's, uh, some protocols use it. Uh, uh, some protocols use the assist uh, staging. I don't want to mention that, but I think you know it. And what uh, what has been already mentioned, there are two systems which were uh, suggested by pathologists. That's a Dwarak uh, classification and uh, another Mandat, new Mandat classification. They were suggested by post morphologists, but since uh, radiologists, in particular Gina Brown, who's a classic in this case, she uh, she wants to, she tries to find those changes, post morphological changes. She, she tries to find those changes at the MRI slides, and at least she she is doing that, or at least she found some close correlation. What is it based on? Upon those mandante Dwarak systems, what is it, what is it, what are they based upon? They are based on the ratio on fibrous tissue and tumor tissue. More tumor, less fibrosis. Less fibrosis, less tumor. Uh, only fibrosis, no tumor, uh, or only tumor, no fibrosis. That's the basis of those classifications. That's uh, well, that's how TRG looks like. Morphologically, you see uh, cancer 
cancer models and fibrosis, fibrosis models and cancer, residual microscopic cancer, no residual cancer. Here we see a complete clinical regression prior to treatment, the date of our clinic, the rectal cancer growing through all the walls and into the fat. The tumor margin was from the proper, uh, proper fascia by three millimeters. And we see a solitary increased lymph nodes, uh, such as metastatic. After chemo radiation, the eight weeks uh, break, no tumor is visualized, T0. Changes in the intestinal wall uh, uh, are present only with fibrous tissue. No lymph nodes was found. They, were, they did surgery. Mm, and uh, the result of histology, uh, we saw complete pathological reaction of the tumor and lymph node. So as you can see, we can at least uh, forecast it. This data, I would like to develop on this data. Why are we doing this? Why are we, uh, Here you can clearly see uh, how survival rate depends on the regression rate. The higher is pathological regression rate post uh, chemo radiation, the better survival is. Uh, and it's clearly shown here. And that's our data. We have a data at, uh, with uh, 0 to 143 patients with a local uh, spread cancer. It's not T1, uh, T2, T2, but 3, 2, 3, T4 cancers. 143 patients with follow-up to uh, 68 months. Mm, uh, local relapse rate is 5.5%. It looks like within the average uh, numbers, but look at the red uh, line. Patients with complete or almost complete pathological regression during the follow-up didn't have the sign didn't have the signs of progression so the relapse rate was zero it's not a very big uh, sample and of course mm, uh, but still it's very very important data those patients didn't, uh, didn't have any signs of progression neither local nor distant metastasis that's why in many studies today uh, getting the complete pathological regression is a so-called the surrogate end point for the studies not to wait for the results for many years so we can reach this regression it means it's a good prognostic factor that's why today it is suggested to use such an uh, improved uh, treatment scheme with stage patients with all the methods, then we do chemo and radiation. Then we restage the patient and then use the same terminology, good, bad, and ugly, with a good clinical, uh, with a good prognosis, I mean, complete clinical regression. We can consider in specialized clinics use uh, use this uh, observational approach, watch and wait. Sometimes they say it's a conservative treatment. No, it's not right. Nobody suggested to treat uh, uh, cancer, uh, rectal cancer in, uh, in the conservative way. Uh, this is how, how Abrahama says, is it's, a, we, uh, it's not conservative, but a waiting. So it's a watch and wait uh, management. So look, watch, and wait. Uh, and if there is first signs of the uh, relapse, the surgery will be provided immediately in any case, and all those patients should be followed up during whole their life. But that's, just, but that's another talk. That's then uh, poor prognosis uh, or bad prognosis with a co almost complete clinical regression, then local excision, and ugly uh, incomplete regression. The tumor didn't respond. We should, uh, we should uh, uh, admit that as to the, our data, international data, about 70% of tumors, they respond to chemosal radiation. We see some regression, more or less, of it, but still 70 is not 100, and 30% or even more. We can see things, we see things like uh, stabilization. I mean, tumor didn't respond to that, and actually uh, taking patients with a local spread, locally advanced cancer to such treatment, we will offer surgery to the patient with the same stage as he had before. And sometimes it's, so that's why somebody says that it doesn't improve the results, but since the results are not improved because of such patients. But if there is regression, it's also better. But if there is no regression, if it's a local advanced cancer, then what we cannot count on anything else. We can, we, there is a situation where we had to do that, but should know, but we should assume something, uh, something some treatment in post-op in adjuvant mode. Uh, watch the way it algorithm. I don't have much time for that separate topic, which maybe we will uh, discuss it. We should maybe should discuss it in separate conference. There's lots of issues to be discussed. It's quite an interesting program, and it's based on a very logical and clear, uh, mm, so to say, uh, definitions and terms. What, I can say, what, can we, what we can say today about the complete clinical response? Of course, it's uh, uh, still uh, investigational. We need to have informed patient consent. Without that, we cannot we cannot offer any uh, alternatives in treatment. Of course, it's uh, really to be used only within some protocols, only for uh, low located tumors. Why? Because patients with such tumors, they have really high chances for permanent colostoma. 
due to the peritoneal and uh, uh, peritoneal extirpation. That's why we need to search for some alternative interventions, which is very important. And of course, we don't have clear evidences uh, that it could be used in, so to say, in general practice, in routine practice. Then Professor Gerald, he uh, uh, said such a um, slogan, from sphincter saving to organ saving, to sphincter sparing to organ sparing. So, uh, so um, it means a local excision of uh, rectal cancer, which enables us to uh, radically treat early small tumors and uh, provide local control after radiation. What we call them is a small rectal cancer, it says T1, uh, T1 or 2, and 0, M0. And what what is local excision? Transanal resection, discopic resection, uh, mucosal resection, discopic mucosal dissection, transferic approach, and of course transanal discopic microsurgery. What it will provide us is this TAMs. It's the most modern method. First of all, it allows us to excise all the uh, layers of the rectal wall. Um, it could be used with a tumor located up to 20 centimeters from uh, the anal, uh, from the anus, and it provides, of course, good visualization. And then what should limit us? Here you see the tumor staging was a tumor in the submucosa, which was located by the Kikuchi in 1995. The tumor spread only within the submucosa, but still. Uh, however, says the risk of lymphogenic pedestals in T1 tumors, it goes from 0 to 10 percent. It is it was within the mucosa, but if tumor is beyond the uh, muscle layer, then the uh, risk of uh, regional metastasis, metastasis is 15 to 20 percent. And here, talking about the local excision and use of the local methods with T2 stage, well, it's possible only if we use some additional methods. But I'm I'm trying to say very very carefully that we can we can use it because here we have very high risk, and I think we still cannot do it. Today, the worst result of the local excision are found in cases where they're done if the tumor spreads to the muscle layer. So, so as of today, what we can say about the local uh, excision? It's a good alternative for um, uh, radical interventions. It's very important from the point of organ sparing interventions. It could be used, uh, I suppose, only post uh, pre op radiation. And technology of TAM, of course, it's uh, really promising. It's been developing, and I think it will develop further. Talking about the local advanced uh, rectal cancer, which especially in St. Petersburg, uh, we see here in St. Petersburg, what are the issues, what are the challenges? Today, all one positive thing, uh, local relapse prevention. That problem has been resolved. As you heard, using uh, chemo and radiation, we bring uh, local relapse rate to minimum, almost to zero. Well, if it's not zero, it's uh, not more than two or three percent. So we might not discuss the issue. But he, uh, uh, but hidden metastasis, it's a big problem. Chemo radiation is that's a treatment standard, but chemotherapy per se is ineffective. I would say it's too weak in rectal cancer, so we can hope for that. Why? We can answer the following way. Look, uh, chemo radiation therapy. It's about five weeks. So it's time to surgery. Eight weeks post op period, four weeks. So in the best case, it could be some complications which which might prolong this post op period. So it takes more than four months prior to start of adjuvant chemotherapy. It means that it is uh, not within the adjuvant chemotherapy. That's why that's a weak point of this chemotherapy, that we cannot just start it early, so we do not uh, administer it early. That's why the results are so in, uh, non-satisfactory. Uh, and uh, and they try to study those issues in Europe as a repeater trial. So the main issue, if the annual adjuvant chemotherapy uh, improved survival rate, improved treatment results, they had two arms of treatment. First is a patient with a classical chem chemotherapy and operation, and adjuvant chemotherapy, and second, concentrated uh, chemo radiation, five by five radiation, then not the treatment, but uh, this eight-week interval. But within that interval, they provide six intervals of chemotherapy, and only after that, patients undergo surgery. So the primary outcome, of course, is DFS, uh, cancer-specific survival, of course, and uh, there, of course, there are some uh, uh, secondary comes as a complete pathological response to treatment toxicity, but it's a very important uh, parameters, and it might uh, it might be oh, it looks quite logical, I suppose. So as a conclusion, surgery is a golden standard in treating uh, rectal cancer patients. Uh, the uh, the most important issue when uh, uh, selecting the uh, the very important thing is uh, for us. 
uh, is to look, it's a, it's a kind of a cornerstone, is to consider uh, relation of the tumor to the uh, rectal uh, fascia proper. And I'm using, using most, the most uh, modern surgical methods, majority of ca rectal cancers below the uh, uh, peritoneal fold should be treated using preop radiation. Uh, not all, uh, and she says, that not, not in all clinics they use MRI to assess the process spread. If you don't, don't, don't use it, then we're just trying to guess and we don't know if the radiation should be there or maybe it should. It doesn't necessary. If we do the surgery, good, resp good response, and if there is morphologies, it's good to have them. And then we started to think, oh, maybe we need to do post-op chemo radiation. And institute, we can see it when patients come to us. But in a post-op mode, uh, post-op results are not equal to pre-op uh, results of radiation and chemo. And today, you heard you heard what morphologists said about it. We should remember about the completion uh, of assessment of the quality of the soldiers we offer this data when you talk about the complete almost complete incomplete um, uh, interventions and uh, outcomes and uh, as I said 30 to 50 percent of interventions today uh, they are assessed incomplete in Europe uh, and will Hill all even said that as to his data, almost 30 percent of cases. What does it mean? Is it every second patient they had uh, insufficient resection? We cannot guarantee uh, before surgery that, that we will do things the way we plan them. So maybe from the practical point of, view, point of view, it's better to start to treat patients with radiation, at least using this concentrated mode, pre-op uh, chemo radiation. It decreases the number of relapses and conditions that uh, creates the conditions to um, for sphincter saving or organ saving interventions. Uh, tumor regression uh, uh, rate directly correlates uh, with the survival and the local relapse uh, rate. That's why tumor regression is very important as of today. Tumor regression um, creates conditions for uh, treat, for curing the patients and to uh, and to uh, to say uh, without any post-op complications and mortality. A using of the system to assess tumor regression could provide quite valuable information for the center specialized, specialized in treatment of such patients. Our colleague, he mentioned another classification for regression assessment. I showed three of them. In every country, in every clinic, they uh, work in different ways. But we and but then we compare uh, issues which are actually basically uncomparable. And in patients with rectal cancer with considerable regression, our post chemo radiation therapy, uh, we can do organ saving surgeries with the results not worse than the ones after the radical therapy but the assessment of the spread of the advancement rate is very important. We shouldn't overstage such patients because it means that our opponents will say, oh, no, local excision, it's impossible. You, you see, you have some relapses and uh, distant metastasis. That's, in this case, it will be our fault, but not the method fault, who overstage or erroneously staged the process and offered the patient with inadequate treatment. And thank you for your attention.